online. You can scan that QR code. You also should have received an email from Pastor Brown on Friday, so you can click that, that link as well. The, our guest speaker is Heather Carter, which many of you know well. Um, she's, a, she's a missionary that we support um, with her husband, Lee. Um, so they're back in town. So they, you saw them during the X18 conference as well. So, so yeah, sign up for that. The cost is $10. Um, and then secondly, our dinner theater is coming up as well, only less than a month away. It is November 22nd through 23rd, a Friday and a Saturday. So um, if you would like to come to that, invite a friend. You can scan that QR code as well. Also, if, um, if technology is not your thing, you can also call up to the office and, um, and get signed up as well. But um, that's going to be a sweet time. Um, I'm assuming there will be many puns based off the title. So come find out what other ones you'll, you'll get to hear. Um, cost is $15 for that. Um, and then also, I have to make this plug because I'm allowed to. Um, the youth group will be serving, and so uh, they are already signing up. Many signed up last Sunday to, um, to serve at the dinner theater, um, and if, if you so choose um, any tips that are given, we'll go to their, their camp, um, which is a huge blessing for them, and I can't, I can't thank you all enough for the last few years because there's been many, many students that weren't going to be able to come, or um, and just, just a blessing um, to have that help, and so um, they're, not all, they're not only learning how to serve and hopefully having more appreciation for their servers at restaurants and stuff because it's not an easy job. But also they get money towards camp. So um, if you can make it to that, man, I highly encourage you to do it. It's, it's always a, a really, really good show. Um, so yeah, come on out for that. Um, also, it was a fun, exciting weekend at First Bible this weekend. Our Pee Wee football finished up. Man, thank you all to all those that coached and, and helped out and did concessions and field supervised. Uh, man, it was, it was a really sweet time. Um, it, it's, I, I always love the last week because you get to hear from all the parents that just express their appreciation. Um, and so thank you all that served with that. And then some of you took a 10 minute break and then went right into trunk or treat. Um, so that was a, another sweet time as well. Thank you to all those that, um, that served, that did concessions, that did a trunk. Um, Miss Marty with her tractor, that's always a hit. Um, the welcome team was awesome. And so man, thank you so much for that. Um, God gave us sweet weather this week or this year, um, so we are very thankful for that. But yeah, that was a, that was a sweet time. So thank you all that, that helped out for that. It was a it was a big week, a big weekend at, at First Bible. So um, so yeah. Um, all right, as we get into our message today, I have a baby. That's her. Um, her name is Delaney. She is eight months old, um, and she is entering that my favorite stage of babyhood. I don't know if that's a word or not. Where she sits up on her own which I love. This may be because I'm partly lazy, but I like to sit her in the living room and then walk away and not have to stare at her um, for the next hour or so, right? And so I really appreciate that stage. Uh, many of you with babies, maybe, maybe you're in the same boat and appreciate that one as well, or maybe you're really close to it. Sanchez is sitting up soon, maybe. She's a strong little girly, so. <laughs> um, so they're training her over there right now, so if you got it. Um, but as I've been thinking about uh, my little Delaney, man, so many times I, I, I love to, to picture how her development is a picture of our spiritual development as well, right? And so, man, one of, my, one of my things I try to remind myself of so often is that, man, somebody comes to Christ, accepts Jesus as their Savior. The Bible says they're born again. And so I, when, when Delaney was born, we did not send her out in the world and say, all right, let us know if you need help, right? We, we had to come alongside of her and from day one, she needed the most help, right? And so, man, if you get the opportunity to lead somebody to Christ, we can't forget that, that they need us as they move on. They're, they're, they're not just gonna, okay, they, they didn't grow up in church like, like some of you, right? They don't know how to just, to just go serve the Lord, right? They, they need to be shown. And then, like I said, as, as she gets... As, as we get to the sitting up stage, right? I, maybe that's one of my, maybe that's a spiritual reason why I like that phrase is because, man, that's the, that's the phase in, in, um, in a young believer's life where, man, they, they, they've got a little bit of freedom. They, they, can, they, can, they can stand up on their own. They can sit up, stand up on their own, right? And, and even Delaney loves her, um, her Fruit Loops or Cheerios these days, right? And that one's fun too because you can sit her in her high chair, throw some Cheerios on the plate, and she's good for like 45 minutes, right? And man, that's a cool picture as well, right? Because we as believers have to learn how to eat. We have to learn how to go study the Bible. And then 
Man, there's a, there's a sweet passage in um, 1 Peter 2.2 2 that talks about how at some point we get past the sincere milk of the word and into the more complex, deep issues of the Bible, right? And so, man, all of these little stages are, man, are beautiful pictures of what we go through as believers. And so, man, if you get the opportunity to be around a little one, man, it's, it's so sweet just to, just to watch them and see all those different stages of and just be reminded Maybe, maybe it's just to be reminded of those sweet stages in your own life. I mean, to, to, to see the, the, that, that growth and maybe to see it in other people's lives as well. Um, and so just like that path of a baby, um, we as believers have a path as well. So if you want to take your, uh, turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter 1, um, there is a cool path here laid out um, where, where God shows us, hey, what does it look like to grow in the word of God? 2 Peter chapter 1, we will read verses 5 through 9. We did this passage for our, our we did, we've been doing like a camp, uh, post-camp devotion that, that goes in their booklets, right? And um, they can do when they get home. That way they, it encourages them to continue reading, continue having that quiet time, right? That was Emily Hodges' idea. That was a great idea. Um, and so, man, it's, it's such a cool passage because it, it, it's going to bring about all these words that show us, hey, once you're here, you need to add this. And then once you're there, you need to add this, right? And it, it's such a sweet reminder because sometimes we get ahead of God and we say, hey, I really need more knowledge. Great thing, right? However, there's steps before that, right? So let's read that. Second um, Peter chapter one, verses five through nine. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. So at, on, on the screen you see we've bolded these, these steps in growth, right? And, and the very first one is faith. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, that's our baseline. You've made a step of faith. You've made a profession of faith, right? So you can't be a child of God without some level of faith. So that's our baseline, right? And obviously we're gonna grow in faith, um, but that, that's our baseline, right? But then it moves on to virtue, which man, if there's a favorite, it's, it, it may be this one. This one's huge because the Bible tells us in um, 2 Corinthians 5.20 that we are God's ambassadors. So if you think of an ambassador today, right, if we have an ambassador to Ireland or something, a random country, right, they are representing the United States. We have ambassadors down in Argentina right now. They are representing First Bible Baptist Church and ultimately the body of Christ and the Lord, right? And so, man, when you think about that, we don't, we don't just choose any random people to be ambassadors, right? I mean, I, not too long ago, Dennis Rodman was an ambassador. That one threw me for a loop. I was like, why? Anyways, we'll move on. Um, but we don't just choose anybody, right? And so that same thing is true of you. God has chosen you to be an ambassador of him. And so if you've chosen to take that step of faith, your very next step is virtue, because as an ambassador of Christ, you need to represent him well. And we know our savior lived on this earth, zero sin, never sinned. So then that's not expected of us, right? Praise the Lord, but you're expected to represent him. And so we have to add that virtue to our faith so that we're a positive ambassador for him, right? I mean, I, hearing students talk about Christian clubs and everything, right? I hear this a lot that, oh, I don't wanna go to that cl so club, so-and-so is a hypocrite, right? And it's like, man, we gotta be careful with that, right? They see that, they so obviously see that, hey, your words aren't matching your actions. However, if they don't go, who's going to? And so th this, this step of virtue is so big for us. And then after that, we add knowledge, right? And man, knowledge encompasses so many things, right? It's not just, hey, in faith place, I can raise my hand and know where Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 is. Or, hey, I know who the, who the, what, what the Trinity is, right? Those things are really important also, but man, God's calling us to get to know him. If I, if I claim or, or I desire to be godly, which another word coming up here, right? Then I have to understand who God is. 
I have to understand what it even means to be godly, right? And so God's calling us to add knowledge to our virtue. And then the next one up on your screen is probably, if, if not virtue, this is definitely my favorite, is temperance. Temperance. We have a girl in our youth group named Temperance. I love saying her name. It's fun. Um, but, man, I, I heard this, this cool analogy um, about how um, we, we can think of this in terms of tempered glass. Okay? Many of you guys know what tempered glass is. It is all around you. Um, when you get in your car to go home, you will see tempered glass right in front of your face, right? And it, is, it describes a type of glass that has been heated up to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that does is it makes that, that glass to be stronger. Praise the Lord if you ever hit a bird or a rock or something, right? Praise the Lord that, that glass is strong. It also allows it to be more malleable, right? You think of your car windshield, it's curved. And then also, really big one, if you've ever driven by a car accident, you notice if, if something hits your window hard enough or your, your windshield hard enough to break it, you don't see big two foot long shards of glass. What does it look like? It looks like thousands, millions of little tiny pieces. And that is an exa- that's a result of being tempered as well. And so because of that, that glass is in a better shape to do, to fulfill its purpose, right? Well, God calls us to be tempered as well. And so in the same way, we will be heated up to a thousand degrees. I don't know, maybe, maybe less than that. I don't know, that's, that's hot, right? But then the same result should happen in our lives. We will become stronger. We will become more malleable. And also in those times of weakness when we're breaking and man, praise the Lord, if we're tempered, we're not hurting others around us because of, because of our, our failures and, and faults as well, right? And so man, what a beautiful picture for us to be tempered. And then if you've been heated up to a thousand degrees, you will learn patience, right? That, that, that patience just kind of comes as a result of it. And then after that, um, we move into godliness, which we'll, we'll talk, talk more about in a little bit, about how, man, why does patience make you more godly? And then moving on to brotherly kindness, which is huge for us as the body of Christ, right? I was just talking to somebody at Trunk or Treat yesterday about, man, just, just the, the need, the desire to walk into this place and, man, feel loved, feel the kindness, right? Because we're all going through things. And we need some place to, 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 to be edified, to be encouraged, right? Because we don't often get it from the world. And then finally, our last stage is charity, which, man, it's such a beautiful word, right? It's, it, it's, it's a step beyond love, right? It's sacrificial. It, it, it's something that, man, it, there, there's, no, um, there, there's, there's no coincidence that we use that word charity for, for donations and stuff, right? It is, it is a love that's beyond yourself, right? And so... As a church that values discipleship and as uh, church members and, 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 and attenders that, that value discipleship, discipleship, this is huge for us to understand. I mean, as, as we were talking about this and, and after our summer camp, you can kind of, some, some of them can kind of point and say, yeah, I think I'm about right here. Maybe you're going through a time of tempering or may, maybe, man, you're, you're focused, you're taking a Bible Institute class and you're like, man, I really need knowledge, Right. We, we can kind of point and say, maybe, man, I think this is kind of where God has me right now. But all throughout this, this process, there's a really important key that we can't miss. And it's, it's the title of our message today. Uh, we're going to read about David, who was called a man after God's own heart. And so we'll talk a little bit about today. What, man, what did God and what did Samuel, um, through the Holy Spirit, mean, man, when he said a, a man after God's own heart? So let's pray before we get into it. God, we love you. God, we just, man, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather in your house. God, thank you for our worship team. Man, I was just sitting over there thinking, man, not many churches have three, man, uh, people who can lead worship that well. And we are so blessed um, with, with the worship that, um, that we experience in, the, in your house, God. And um, Lord, we just pray, Father, that, um, Lord, we're going to take the Lord's Supper after this, God. But, um, but, but before that, you're calling us to be men and women after your own heart. And so, God, that, that involves examining ourselves like we do with the Lord's Supper. And so, God, would, would you take some time today through your word to examine us? God, would you bring to mind things, God, that, that maybe we've forgotten, uh, but, but, God, things that you've asked us to do that maybe we've put on the back burner so that, Lord, we can be pleasing unto you. God, we love you. We ask these things in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you're still in 2 Peter, let's jump over to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, not Samuel. Um, Chapter number 13. 
So this is a cool passage where we are transition or where we're starting the transition from Saul to David, right? So before this, Israel had come to the prophet Samuel and said, hey, we want a king. And they make this really interesting statement. We want to be like other nations and we want a king that will reign and rule over us, right? And Samuel's response is, hey, you have a king. He's your God. And that's all the king you really need. However, they persist. They continue even while, man, there's a, there's a cool passage in here where even while Samuel's telling them, hey, you don't need a king. We've, we're, God's providing a king, but you don't need him. Your king is God. And they kind of, it seems like they kind of shake their heads and go, yeah, cool, but give us our king still, right? And so at, at this point, Saul is starting his reign as king. However, it doesn't get off to a good start. He quickly, after, I mean, after, after one big failure and then leading into others, we see this phrase that, that God sees the failure of Saul and then makes this statement that, hey, we got to remove Saul because I need a man after my own heart. So let's read First Samuel chapter 13. We'll start in verse 5. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sands which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward from Beth Haven, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed. Then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. Verse 7. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead, as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. Verse 10. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, and he might, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not um, from, uh, within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, The Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. Interesting phrase here. And I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandments of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Check out verse 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So, man, we, we see there's so much in this passage that shows, I mean, what led to this transition? And then also, why, like, why did God choose to use this phrase through Samuel of, I mean, I need a man after my own heart. See, because if we compare, so we're going from Saul to, to David here, right? And Saul, the Bible says that he was, a, he was the son of a mighty man of power. It also talks about he was literally head and shoulders of everybody, over everybody else, right? Physically, very impressive. And he had the lineage to look back on and say, yeah, this is, this is our dude. But then we compare that to David, who when Samuel came to Jesse and said, hey, I'm looking for, for um, somebody among your brother or of your sons, they didn't even bring David. He was back tending the sheep, right? Even though he was, a, he was a man that had killed a lion and a bear, right, protecting his sheep, he wasn't even brought to the table as an option when Samuel came to Jesse, right? And so as we see this transition, I think there's, there's three big things I think we can look at, and there's, there's likely others as well, that we can look at is why, first of all, why did God use this phrase of a man after his own heart? And then, man, what, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us as men and women who are called to be men and women after God's own heart as well? And so the first one that we'll look at is that waiting reveals your heart. Waiting reveals your heart. So in 1 Samuel chapter 13, right, the very first mess up was a result of, of Saul choosing not to wait. I think it's so interesting that 
it says that right after he got done making that sacrifice, who shows up? Samuel. And so I wrote next to that verse in my Bible, don't jump the gun. I don't know how long it took him to, to, to uh, prepare that sacrifice and to, and to make the sacrifice, right? But we're talking hours where he, if he had just waited, then he would not, man, he, he, he would not have lost his calling, right? And so we, man, we have that same opportunity as well that we are called to wait upon the Lord. I'll never forget, man, one of the, I think it was David Guadron in the coffee house a few years ago, you know, he, he shared his testimony about how when he went um, to, uh, to, to, be a, to be a missionary, he, I think he gave the example of, um, you know, he said, hey, if you're ever going to be a missionary, write all the things down um, that, that you're going to do and, and make out a plan and, and, and lay it out five years, 10 years, and then take that, crumple it up and throw it in the trash can, right? Because when you get there, God may change everything. And God may, may take that time to show you and reveal to you the things that he has for you. And so, man, I, I think this is one of the most drastic comparisons that we could make. Here we have, we have Saul who really, really quickly, it's, I think it says after, um, yeah, verse 13 starts with, and Saul reigned one year and then he fails to wait upon the Lord. But then think about David. Is David not one of the best examples we have of a man who waited? Check out Psalm 13. It's on your screen. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. Psalm 13, we see a, a, a phrase used many, many times. Starting in verse 1, it says, How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord? Forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God, and lighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest mine enemies say I have prevailed against him, and those that trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in thy mercy, my heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. So we see this phrase, how long, and man, I don't know about you, but I'm really grateful for this psalm, because when, when we look at David and, 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 first, and first Samuel, He's waiting really, really well, but we don't see the inward struggle. But we see it here in, in, in Psalm chapter 13 that, man, this was hard for him to do. Even as a, as a man who was called a man after God's own heart, it was hard for him to wait upon the Lord. He felt abandoned at times. He, man, he's asking these questions of God, but man, as so many Psalms often do, the Psalm ends with him coming to grips with who his Savior is, right? with who the God that he's talking to is. He's expressing his frustrations, his emotion, emotions, but at the end he knows, and I'm talking to the God of the universe that created, that, that created the universe with his own, with his own words. And so um, uh, Deuteronomy 8.2, it's another cool passage for us to consider as we, as we think about this, this waiting period. It says, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to provoke thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And so, man, I think about David when you read this passage, right? He, as Saul was pursuing David to kill him, he had two opportunities to return the favor and kill Saul before he was killed first, right? Two opportunities. He was even so close as to cut off the corner of his, of his garment. And say, hey, Saul, this is how close I was to you. I could have taken you out. And yet he waited. He chose to, to wait upon the Lord to do the things that he knew God wanted to do anyways, but in God's timing. Not, not to jump the gun and, and, and to go after something just because we know we want it, we know we desire it. Right? And, and as I look around the room, so many of you guys have had those, those periods of waiting in your life. Man, maybe, maybe you've waited on a child. Maybe you've waited on a spouse. Man, as it's so common, it feels like maybe you've been waiting on a medical diagnosis. Your body's been in pain and in hurt, and man, nobody can figure out what's going on. Those, those things are difficult to wait through. And yet, if, if, if you've been through those times, you can look back and say, man, that seven months was long, those three years were long, right? 
man, once, once you're on the other side, are you not brought to a place of thankfulness? It was hard, it was difficult, right? But now I, I have a story to tell. I can encourage others to wait upon the Lord as I was called to do, right? And so then, th- then those months, those years, they become a number in your story. Where when you're sharing what God's taken you through, you can say, yeah, I've been through that. I had to wait three years for this. I had to wait seven months for this, right? And it was hard, but God got me through it. And it revealed our hearts. We get to the point where, 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 we, uh, where we bring about a, a, a deeper and deeper trust in the Lord. See, Deuteronomy 8 goes on to talk about how as the children of Israel were being brought out, man, they, they, when, they, when they made it into the promised land, because of their waiting, because of the journey that it took, it, it, it talks about how they're, they're not going to be likely to just immediately turn from God. See, every second, every hour, every day, every month, every year that you wait is going, to, is going to be a sweet reminder to you that God came through. The longer it took, the more deeply it's going to be enrooted in your heart and your mind. Uh, Isaiah 40, 30, 31. I kind of want you guys to sing this with me because it was a VBSC song. You guys down? Okay, I saw enough heads. Let's do this. Okay, ready? Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall rock and not faint. Yeah, there we go. All right, I'm going to give you guys another opportunity. I need more help from you guys, okay? <clears throat> Isaiah 40 tells us, Man, I, I wrote next to, my, next to my, this verse in my Bible that men wait on the Lord. So you can, you can remember when you were a youth and you fainted, where you didn't quite have those times to look back on and go, yeah, I'm not, I'm not positive God's going to come through here. And so we don't wait and we jump the gun, right? But as men and women who have seen the goodness of God, we can wait because we know it's coming. We have example after example of people in scripture that know if I choose to wait on the Lord, he will meet me. The Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw nigh to you. And you can take that to the bank. He's gonna do it. You choose to draw nigh to God, he's going to draw nigh to you. I mean, I can't can't help but think about Saul in this this scenario, right? A couple hours, however many hours that he, he should have waited. And because of that, he lost his calling. Man, that, that hits me deep. Can you imagine? You're king of Israel, and you chose to jump the gun a few hours, and all of a sudden, your calling's been removed. Your kingdom that was placed in your stewardship is being taken from your hands. Man, I don't want to be there. I don't want to be a man that has his calling stripped away because of my failure to wait on the Lord. Next one on your screen is God's fight for your heart is a fight against your will. See, so yeah, if we think back to that, that um, 2 Peter 1 passage about that, those steps in our walk with the Lord, right? I think there, there's, no, there's no one step in there. I guess, you know, charity obviously deals with the heart, right? But there's no one step in there that says, hey, at this step, God's going to deal with your heart. He's going to get your heart right, and then after that, you'll be golden, right? That, that doesn't say that. See, because in your sanctification process, in your discipleship process, interwoven into all that is going to be God dealing with your heart and God fighting for your heart. It's not going to go away. And so we better get used to it. We better get used to the times where God allows us to, to go through difficult times to see what's in our heart, to see if we'll keep his commandments or no. I mean, maybe if you've been in the, that period of waiting or maybe you're, you're coming towards the end of it, man, you can, you can be reminded of the fact that, man, sometimes God allows you to wait a little longer just so that you are sure. You waited, you, you know. There were so many times where you wanted to jump the gun, right? But he allowed you to wait, maybe to just examine your heart a little bit more so that maybe you ask yourself the question, God is, why do I want this thing? Why do I want a child? Why do I want to be married? Why do I want this job? Why do I want healing from my, from my medical ailment, right? Why, why do I want these things? 
And then we have to answer that question honestly, because God's got us in a spot where he's saying, hey, I need you to know this. I need you to remember this time. Acts 13, verse 21 through, 20, uh, 21 through 22, we see this phrase again. And I love it because it ends with, it, with this cool phrase that we'll, that we'll get to, right? Acts 13 says, And afterward they desired a king, and God gave unto them Saul the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave their testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And it, I, I wonder the, those of you in the, in the audience that, that, have, that are in charge of people at work, right? Don't you just want sometimes somebody to just do what you ask? <laughs> Without... 16 other ways they want you to do it, or, oh, no, I, 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 you, your way was fine, but my way was better, right? Don't you just want somebody that's just going to do what you asked them to do, right? That's where God's at right now. He didn't want Saul's incredible ideas on how to, to, to lead the kingdom of Israel. He wanted somebody that was going to follow him, and so he found one in David. He found somebody that was willing to fulfill all of God's will, despite our own will, despite the things that we wanted. Once again, Saul was called a, the son of a mighty man of power. So I can just imagine, he's thinking, I, I've watched my dad, I've got this. I know how to do these things, I know how to battle, I know how to lead. But yet he failed to recognize that, man, our call is to follow God's will, not our own. So, man, maybe you're here today and, and you're feeling stalled in your relationship with God. Maybe you're at the point where you're like, man, I see all those steps. I don't see that happening in my life. I think we have to ask ourselves, man, maybe, maybe, God's, maybe, my, maybe I'm fighting God's will right now. Maybe God's asking me to take a step, but I have my other plans and my ideas that are hindering me, that, that are keeping me from taking that step. I, I've been kind of personally convicted um, to stop saying these two phrases. The first one is, oh, that I could never do that. Because that phrase is kind of saying that, hey, I know who I am and that, that could never happen in my life. And I just wonder, like, how many characters in the Bible would have been asked that and they would have said, oh, yeah, never would have been me, right? Consider Gideon, who we went over in VBSC, right? A, a, a man who, when he was told, hey, you're, you're going to judge Israel. Nope, that doesn't, that doesn't sound like me. I'm not from an important family. I'm not an important person. That, that, that can't be me, Right? And so, man, I, maybe, it's a, maybe it's an issue of forgiveness, but whatever, right? There's going to be times where we're like, that, just, that doesn't sound like me. I don't think I could ever do that. But, man, maybe God's going to make you eat your words one day. <laughs> and he's going to say, actually, you can, because I can transform you into whoever I'd like you to be if you let me. Man, maybe, maybe you're at a place where, man, your kids aren't quite doing what you hoped they would do. Or maybe your grandkids, they're not quite that they're not quite being exactly who you wanted them to be, or your job is not quite exactly what you envisioned. Man, can we trust, and I know this is hard, please don't, please don't um, think I'm taking it lightly, but can we take those times to say, man, this is where we're at. I can regret it all I want, I can be frustrated, I can be mad that we're in this position, but this is where we are. If my kid's stubborn, that's where we are, that's where we are, so how do we move forward from here? How do we take that step to say, hey, this is, this is, where, my, well, this is where my grandkid is right now. How do we, how do we improve? What, is that, what does my grandkid need from me to help? To help convince him of the goodness of God. To help convince him that, man, if you do the right thing, no matter what, God will bless you for it. And God will, man, if we humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God, that he will exalt us in due time. And can I just remind you that God allowed those things and, and I'm not saying that there wasn't sin involved, whatever, maybe there was, but God still allowed it. He allowed it to happen and God, he will see us through it. And consider all the different people in the Bible that would be great examples of this, right? Consider, um, consider Job. Promise you that wasn't his plan for his life. Consider Jeremiah, a prophet who didn't have much fruit. That wasn't the plan for his life. Consider Paul. I don't think he was planning on getting beat half to death, right? That wasn't his plan, 
But those, those men submitted to the will of God and said, you know what? We can do this. This is where I'm at right now, and man, I'm excited to see, where, see how God takes us out of this. All right, this is your second chance. Hebrews 11, 6. Can you guys do it? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Thank you. That was a little better. <laughs> Hebrews 11. Man, I was reminded of this verse recently because, like, I think a lot of times we, we, you know, we ask God, like, hey, I want to be absolutely sure. Or, hey, I, I, want, I want you to confirm. I want you to do all these things in our life. But, man, and none of those things are bad. Please don't get me wrong, right? But can we be reminded of the fact that it's faith that pleases God? That us taking a step of faith and saying, hey, God, I'm not positive you want me to go talk to this person at Sam's, but I know you've called me to share the gospel, and this person's ready and available. Maybe I just need to take a step of faith. I love the analogy Bobby uses. Um, <clears throat> he, he uses the analogy of like when you're walking up into Price Chopper, right? And you're not sure whether the door is open or not. What are you going to do? You're going to stand back and wait for somebody to go test it or maybe get your phone out and zoom in. No, you're going to walk towards it, right? And God, man, God honors that faith of, hey, God, I, I'm not sure I'm the right person for this. I don't know if I have the words to say, God, but I'm going to trust you because that's, that's, what, that's what the Bible says pleases you. And I, I like this, this, uh, this difference. The next slide shows you a, a cool difference between one of Saul's answers when he's challenged and then one of David's answers. So 1 Samuel 15, uh, 13 through 14. Um, so a background story, Saul is told, hey, I want you to take the Amalekites out. Take them out. Don't spare anything, anyone, right? And so Saul, coming back from this battle, has this answer to give Samuel when he approaches. Verse 13, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. What a big, strong statement. But then verse 14, and Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and of the lowing of the oxen, oxen which I hear? Man, I, Samuel's bold. I like this dude. He calls him out immediately. You're going to stand here and say, I have fulfilled the commandment of the Lord when I can literally hear sheep that you spared? And, and man, Saul did it for a, a, a good reason per se, right? He was going to use those sheep to, to sacrifice to God. But man, the beautiful part about this, and I think the encouragement for us is that we don't have to, to, to doubt God's judgments in our lives. God judged Saul here because God knew Saul's heart. He can stand up there and give all the reasons that he wants, but the reality of it is God's judging, and God judges according to the heart. So we don't have to doubt it, because if your friend does something and you don't understand, you don't understand what, why they're in that scenario, right, and you're doubting God, why would you let this person through it? Know that God knows that person's heart. Maybe they're not telling you the whole story. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, right? But we can trust God's judgment because he's the only one that knows the heart. He's the only one that can confidently say, yes, Saul did this for this reason, because God knew his heart. But then we see David's response over in chapter 20. David's coming up to, uh, to Jonathan, um, who was Saul's son and, and good friend um, of, of David. And, it's, and this is after Saul's trying to kill David, right? Verse one says, and David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, what have I done? What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? And what a difference. We've got Saul over here saying, I have done the commandment of the Lord. And then you've got a man who's running for his life. And he's saying, man, what, did I do something wrong? And what, why is this guy trying to kill me? He's not, he's not just jumping to the fact that, oh, Saul's just an evil dude, no biggie, right? Kind of true. But he's asking, hey, God, is there something wicked in me? Am I, have I done something wrong that, that's leading to this terrible situation in my life? And so this kind of leads us to our last one. The last statement that I think we can learn from this, um, this, this transaction is, you are more likely to abandon something you know than something you love. And that might not quite follow in your head, so hopefully it will soon, but... Man, I, I believe this man after a God's own heart is, it, man, it, it, it's one of the most powerful statements he can make on a, on a man or woman's life. Because, man, 
I believe that God's after your heart primarily. Does he want your mind? Absolutely. But primarily, the heart is where it's at. Why? Because man, when we look at um, when, when Samuel, um, later on in, in chapter 16, verse 7, it says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And so we can compare, right? Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. And then we have David, both had failures in their lives, right? And David was a man after God's own heart. So we can kind of compare these and go, which one's more important? Should I ask for wisdom or should I ask for a heart that pleases God, right? But man, I think this statement reminds us of the fact that, man, I don't know about you, but I've had times where I know what's right and I didn't do it. And that's humbling. But I think we're more likely to abandon what we know as opposed to abandoning what we love. I don't think many people abandon the things that they love more than anything else. That's kind of how we make our decisions, right? If I have a 50-50 decision to make, which thing do I love more? Man, am I going to go serve the Lord here because I love him that much? Or do I have other things to do, right? We make that decision based off what we love. And so, man, I, I think I've shared this before, but the very first message I ever got to share, I, I look back on it so surprisingly because I was a senior in college and I was going up to school in Iowa. And for some reason, the pastor there let me preach on a Sunday. I have no clue why. I was, once again, I was 18 or I guess 20 whatever years old, right? And I have no clue why he let me, but he did. And what God led me to was to talk about how, man, we have gates in our lives and those gates need to be protected, right? And man, you can look at your neighbor's face and see some of the gates, right? They have your, your eyes, you have to protect those. What you see affects you. You have your ears. What you hear affects you. You have your mind. What you think about affects you. But more so than all of those gates, I think our, the one that we have to guard most closely is our heart. Because once something goes in your heart, man, it's hard to get out. You may have images that have been burned into your retinas and you can't ever stop seeing, right? Or maybe you have thoughts or a jingle that you can't get out of your head. Or maybe, man, all, all these things that, that sometimes just get in there and stick. And man, so many things get stuck in that heart. I mean, sometimes it takes a long time to get out, right? So one of the most popular verses that we quote in the youth group is, is Proverbs 4.23, especially with Man, young, young ladies who, um, who, who, man, we so desperately desire um, to be protected. It says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And so once again, we, man, this heart thing is huge. We can't, we can't get past it. God's after your heart. And if you have anything that you can give to the Lord, like that, that, that popular song these days, if I have, if, if I have nothing else to give, I, I want to give you my heart. I want to give you a heart of sacrifice and of praise. So, man, I, I, don't, I don't know where you are today. Like I said, maybe, maybe you're stuck and you don't, you're not seeing that Romans 12, 1 and 2 transformation in your life. You're not rapidly growing. Man, maybe it seems like you're stuck sometimes. Or, man, maybe it seems like you read a, f a few days in a row and it's just not, man, there, there's, there's nothing sticking out to you or whatever, right? Perhaps, man, may, maybe God's asking us to examine our hearts. Once again, interwoven in that discipleship, in that sanctification process, so many times we're going to have to be faced with the contents of our heart. And so maybe that's what God's asking you to, to look at today. Is my heart ready to be, to, be, um, to be sanctified, to be discipled, right? Or am I holding back? Am I, am I not allowing God to completely transform me because of, because of the contents in my heart? So why don't you pray as we, as we close? Or sorry, why don't you stand as I pray, sorry. <laughs> Father God, we love you. God, we're going we're gonna to take the Lord's Supper here in a few minutes, God. But, but man, God, we ask of you, Lord, that as your ordinance commands, that, that we take some time to examine our hearts, God. Would, would that be our, our mindset like we see with David? God, somebody that's willing to look inside themselves and ask God to, to, to renew, to change, to, to transform. So God, would that be our heart attitude toward, towards you? That God, we as, as children of you, 
God, that you would see us as men and women who you know will do what you ask. We're not gonna concoct our own ideas and our own strategies on how to do something. We're, we're gonna ask you, God, and, and we're gonna take your orders. And God, when you don't give us those exact orders like we talked about in, um, in Hebrews, God, that, that, man, we're just gonna do what we think you want us to do. And we're gonna take a step of faith that you would be honored with the faith that we show in you. So God, would you search us? Would you try us? Would you know our hearts? Would you see if there be any wicked way in us, God? And would you help us to have the boldness, the courage to address it? God, to, 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 to trust you with, with our lives. God, and even if you don't lead it in the way we think, God, we know that God, we can, we can trust your perfect plan. So as we, as we conclude here, there's...